time. <coughs> Ready? Okay. Um, uh, this, the Hillsborough, um, this, this is the November 12th meeting of the Hillsborough Township Board of Education. In accordance with the State Sunshine Law of New Jersey, adequate notice of this meeting of the Hillsborough Township Board of Education was provided on November 8th to the Hillsborough Beacon and the Courier News. May I have a roll call, please? Sure, Ms. Bogachewski, Ms. Santafonte, Mr. Cooper, Mr. Gillette. Here. Ms. Harris. Here. Mr. Pulsifer. Here. Dr. Susan. Here. Ms. Trujillo. Here. And Ms. Haas. Here. We have a quorum. Thank you. I will now read the a motion. Uh, I will now read the motion to go into executive session. Whereas the Open Public Meetings Act, Chapter 231 of the Laws of 1975, provide that a public body may exclude the public from that portion of a meeting of which the public body discusses certain matters for which confidentiality is required, as permitted in Section 7B of the Act. Resolved by the Board of Education of the Township of Hillsborough and the County of Somerset and State of New Jersey as follows. One, the matters to be discussed are the evaluation of the superintendent and negotiations with the Hillsborough Education Association. The matters discussed in executive session shall be disclosed to the public when the need for confidentiality no longer exists. May I have a motion and second, please? So moved. Thank you. Second. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? We're in closed session. We'll be back at 7.30. We're back from closed session, so I'd like a roll call, please. Sure. Ms. Bogachewski? Ms. Santafonte? Mr. Cooper? Here. Mr. Gillette? Here. Ms. Harris? Here. Mr. Pulsifer? Here. Dr. Sasson? Here. Ms. Trujillo? Here. And Ms. Haas? Here. We have a quorum. Thank you. Um, can everybody please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. <coughs> Moving ahead to the approval of the minutes, we have two sets of minutes. The first being our executive minutes from um, October 29th. May I have a motion and second to approve the executive session minutes? So moved. Thank second. you. Second. Thank you. Any questions, comments? All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, Lorraine abstains. That rhymes. Okay, um, I'll take a motion and second to approve the regular uh, regular public meeting minutes. So moved. Thank you. Second. Thank you. Any questions? Um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Lorraine again. Okay, we recognize the correspondence that we received. And we can move on to the superintendent's report. Thank you, Madam President. Good evening, everyone. It's great to see so many people out tonight. Every month we try to spend a little bit of time spotlighting the great things that are going on throughout the district. And tonight, Spotlight is focused on ARIS and the Safety Patrol. So with that, please join with me in welcoming to our, our podium the principal of ARIS, Mr. Chris Carey. Thank you, Dr. Schiff. Uh, just to we'll get, get a moment, I'll ask all the Safety Patrol members here this evening, as well as our advisors, why don't you join me up at the podium, uh, off to my right. good-looking group, isn't it? Uh, and for, uh, before I go any further, I want to thank the parents. Thank you so much for coming out this evening. I know after a, a four-day sort of a extended weekend, it's tough to come on a Monday evening. Thank you so much. We, we greatly appreciate it. And boys and girls, thank you all for coming. I know when we first uh, came together as a, as a safety patrol uh, early in September, 
I, we had a, an induction ceremony, and uh, we, I had an opportunity to say that I'd love to bring them out one evening to focus on sharing what great things they do for our school. It's not, an, it's not a very easy role, I would say. I know I see it every day, they're working very hard. And I want to pass the microphone in a moment to the, the two advisors who uh, I'll say right now, I am, I'm so very thankful for Ms. Brian Ashwell and Ms. Young for stepping up with this, with this sort of re bringing back the concept of safety patrol at Auton Road. They fulfilled a very large need at our school. You may recall, the <coughs> Board of Ed members, you may recall I did a presentation with the principal in the middle school about the congestion and the, uh, the, just the large numbers that we have at our school. And it was something that we felt was very important, the, the teachers felt it was very important, Ms. Brian Ashwell and Ms. Young did, and they brought this, to, um, brought this up to everyone and we thought it was a great idea. And each and every day, the boys and girls to my right, they step up and they fulfill a very important need. And uh, the, the individual who came from AAA, who helped conduct the induction ceremony, talked about various individuals throughout the years of prominence, I'll say, that have been safety, safety patrol members. Former presidents, we had uh, former president Bill Clinton and Jimmy Carter were safety patrol members. Uh, US Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas, and I, I believe over 20 astronauts, one of them, uh, her name is Mary Ellen Weber. So you're in good company, boys and girls. Just keep doing what you're doing. And uh, I'm gonna pass the microphone off to, again, Ms. Brian Ashwell and Ms. Young, the advisors. I can't thank them enough for the work that they do from the beginning of the year, throughout the year, and, and wrapping things up. So how about a nice round of applause for our two teachers. First off, I want to say thank you to Mr. Carey. Without him, we wouldn't have been able to lead our program. And with these young um, leaders, we thank them so much for their hard work. I'm just going to give you a, a, a brief history of the last three years. We started this program three years ago with sixth graders that had n really no clue what they were signing up for, but they <laughs> were definitely engaged in wanting to be a leader. Um, they set the stage for last year's group. Um, a little history on how we got this group, though, is that in fifth grade, um, sixth graders came into their, their homerooms and kind of recruited them to show why it's important to be a leader in your school. Fifth grade and sixth grade were very close in age here, so when they're in the hallways, they're working with their peers, and a lot of the time they don't necessarily want to say, stay to the right. Um, but after all that, these guys and a few other who could not make it here tonight, they applied, and then they were also nominated by their fifth grade homeroom teacher. Um, and they were recognized last year for being in incoming sixth graders. So what we'd like to do is we have about uh, five safety patrollers that would like to share why they continue to be a patroller. So I'm going to start with Teresa. Teresa. Hi, my name's Teresa Alex and I'm a safety patrol. I became a safety patrol because I wanted to help my school. I wanted to have some type of purpose at my school. Safety patrol really benefits our school because obviously, number one, it keeps the people and the peers of our school safe. But it also benefits the kids around us because it teaches them respect. It teaches them who they should be respecting no matter if they're their peer or their classmate, they know that they should respect them. But it also benefits us safety patrols because it gives us a sense of confidence to tell people what they should and what they shouldn't be doing. It also teaches us responsibility because it makes us responsible for our actions. I really like being a safety patrol and I hope this tradition goes on for a long time after we leave. Thank you. Next we have Rithaja. Good evening, my name is Ritha Bargov and I'm in grade six. I'm proud to say that I'm a safety patrol officer. Safety patrol is a program that allows students to participate in ensuring the safety of their ARIS classmates. There are two main rules that we have in ARIS, no running in the hallway and stay to the right of the hallway. In the past, we've seen these rules fall apart at the end of the day, so a program was created to maintain these rules. Without safety patrol, there would be chaos and disorder at the end of the day. That is why this is why safety patrol is important and helps our school. 
At the end of the day, we stand in the middle of the hallways and guide students safely to their bus departure rooms. Why did I join Safety Patrol? I knew I wanted to help create a safer environment, and when I heard about Safety Patrol, I knew it was a perfect program for me. Thank you, Ms. Brian Ashwell and Ms. Young, for creating this program and allowing me to make an impact in our Marvis School. Thank you for your time. Harini. Good evening, everyone. My name is Harini, and I'm a Safety Patrol Officer at Otten Road Intermediate School. I am so excited about this opportunity where we can showcase the importance of Safety Patrol. I had decided to become a safety patrol officer because I wanted to be a part of the group of students who play an important role in promoting the safety of heirs. I understood that being an officer would help me develop my leadership qualities and I would be able to encourage all students to travel through the school in a regulated and safe, safe manner. I also found out that being part of safety patrol is also fun because of the before school meetings in which officers have the chance to share ideas and thoughts. I also joined safety patrol because it is very important to our school. Since without the officers helping maintain order in the hallways, the dismissal system followed and heirs could get disorderly. The, the Hillsborough Township Public School District is committed to providing a superior, superior education for all students so they can lead us successfully and responsibly into the future. Is the Hillsborough Township District mission statement. I believe Safety Patrol helps fulfill this commitment because it helps students who are officers learn how to handle responsibility, which is a skill that will help them be successful in the future. Safety Patrol also teaches other students good citizenship by encouraging them to follow school rules. In conclusion, Safety Patrol is very important to the school. Thank you. Next up we have Lexa. Lexi. Um, I'm Alexa Gibson. I'm a student at, I'm also a student at Auton Road, and I decided to, I decided to sign that form to become a safety patrol because I thought that would help build my personal confidence. So I used to have trouble believing in myself with sports and things like that, and it really did help. Now, I always go for the goal in lacrosse, except without handing it to someone else, and I'm not afraid to make sure that students are doing the right things in the hallway. And I think this program is very important to Eris. Without officers positioned in the hallways, the school would be absolute chaos after dismissal. There would be students running in all different directions through the halls, which could cause some injuries. And it would also be really hard for those teachers trying to navigate through the hallways. It's absolute chaos. <coughs> and I think it is important for both students and teachers to feel safe in the Eris hallways after dismissal time. Thank you. And last but not least, we have Mara. Hi, my name is Mara McHugh, and I'm a sixth grade. I'm in sixth grade, and I'm an Ares Safety Patrol officer. I decided to become an officer because I think a lot of people think safety patrol is something silly, but I take it away as something to help kids, especially because I've been hurt many times, and our hallways are always so crowded at the end of the day. So it's really there really is no choice that we have a safety patrol. My post is upstairs where kids are rushing to get downstairs to their bus rooms. This is one reason safety patrol is important to our school. Safety patrol is also important to our school because some kids apparently don't know how to stay to the right and because it helps kids understand that we're doing this for them. I've noticed in the past two and a half months of school that kids who walk by me every day start to catch on to the whole stay to the right thing. But I uh, but think by the end of the year, we'll barely have to tell kids to stay to the right. I love Safety Patrol, and I know I am, that I am involved in a great program, and I'm going to do many great things in my future career. Thank you. Why don't we give another big round of applause to all of our Safety Patrol. Thank you also to our advisors who've done a wonderful job leading our, our students, as well as Principal Carey for your fine work. I ask at this time that for the board to take a five minute recess so that we can, we can thank the children and their families for coming out tonight. So ordered, we're in recess, five minutes, thank you.
Thank you, Madam President. I have a few other things under the superintendent's report. First, right under the continuing discussion on investing in our future, which is looking at referenda both in the spring and the fall of next year to help us build a new high school, have full-day kindergarten, as well as address fiscal issues and full-day kindergarten. What I'd like to do tonight is to show you how full-day kindergarten impacts our state aid. Behind me is the actual picture of our state aid notice. This is what we get, this is what all public school districts get from the Department of Education. This goes through how your state aid is calculated. It's a, an 11 page document, I'm not gonna go through all of that tonight. But what I'm going to try to do is to compare how this document would have been affected if we had full day K this year. And you can see what, um, what that impact would be. So I'm going to open up a document, uh, actually it's a spreadsheet that shows the half-day kindergarten uh, compared to the full-day kindergarten. First of all, I'll just walk you through the different stages of the half-day kindergarten program and how, that is, um, how that's calculated. First of all, you can see right here, this is our half-day kindergarten number which is a little under 400. That's an estimate that we receive from the Department of Education. And then it's given a weight, and that weight is 0.5 or half. So our projected weighted enrollment for kindergarten is always half of what our approximate enrollment is. And then from there, there are additional weights that are added for children who qualify for free and reduced lunch. They're um, identified in the state aid formula as at-risk students. Also LEP, which stands for limited English proficiency, as well as both when it's combined limited English proficient and um, at risk or low economic, um, lower economic uh, uh, SES. And then each is given a weight. So if you're a student who qualifies for free and reduced lunch, the weight here is 0.47. LEP only, the weight is 0.5, and if it's combined, LEP and low income, it's 0.595. And all of that is calculated out. Then you get a projected weighted enrollment of, in our case, this particular budget year, it was 7,884 students. And that's the weighted enrollment that the entire state aid formula is built upon. And then they start to calculate it. And right here, 11,209 is the dollar figure that the State Department of Education um, is the multiplier by how many students you have. So it costs a lot more, frankly, than $11,209 to educate a child in, in New Jersey public schools. But that's the base cost um, per pupil expenditure. It's also, we get a little bit more than that because we live in a part of the state that's a little bit more expensive, so we get what's called a geographic cost adjustment. So it's adjusted by 1.0355, which means it's increased by a little over 3.5%. And then it's multiplied out, and that's about $87.4 million in terms of just the um, base enrollment times the uh, total base cost, times the cost adjustment multiplier. And then we have another factor for at-risk only children, as well as limited English proficient children, and a combination of both. And then, and each one gets an individual cost um, for that particular population. And on top of that, we receive additional aid for children who have special needs or qualify for special education services. And the way that the State Department of Education uh, tells us how much aid we're going to get is it multiplies our enrollment times 14.92%. And that's the average rate of classification in the state of New Jersey. Now, if you classify more than 14.92% of the children, or you have more than 14.9% of the children that qualify for special education services, you lose. If you have less than 14.92%, you win. Hillsborough has close to 16% of our children qualifying for special education. Now the cost per pupil is higher 
for a special needs child. Here it's $17,343. It actually costs a lot more than that to educate a special needs child in the state of New Jersey. You also get the cost adjustment, the geographic cost adjustment, and then they take two thirds of that. And that comes to about $12.7 million. You also get a little bit more aid for children who receive speech only services. And then you add up all of these totals here. Every total that you see, that is a cost for the 12 million, the other 80 plus million, and you get what's called the adequacy budget. And this is what the state defines as at least the minimum expenditure that a district should be putting out to, um, to fund a thorough and efficient education in the state of New Jersey. Our adequacy budget with a half day kindergarten program is 104 million. Then there's a local fair share, which the state identifies as what, how much should the taxation be in a community based upon its wealth, which is defined by a combination of income and property value, and the state calculates what's called the local fair share. And when you subtract the local fair share from the adequacy budget, you get a particular aid line, and that aid is entitled equalization aid. And that means it equals it up from where your local fair share is to the adequacy budget. So with a half-day kindergarten program, our equalization aid is about nine and a half, nine point six million dollars or so. And then there are other aid categories. Remember special education was two-thirds, remember that? Well, you get the other third in what's called categorical aid, and that's about six point three million. And then we get some money for security aid. It's about $636,000. And then transportation aid rounds out the categorical aid. When you add the equalization aid, which is defined as formulaic aid, plus the categorical aids, it's 19.3 million. And that's what the state says that the SFRA, the school funding formula, um, that's how much state aid Hillsborough Township should receive. Now in calculating how much aid we do receive, we take what we got the prior year, which was about $25 million, we subtract that from the total categorical and formulaic aid, and we get what's called adjustment aid. And that was the aid that we have been receiving for, for many years here that helps us make sure that we don't get less state aid from one year to the next. And in order to bring us up to what our prior year's aid was, we receive adjustment aid. And the adjustment aid is the difference between how much aid we quote unquote should receive versus how much we did receive. And this adjustment aid is what the state of New Jersey wants to remove from Hillsborough Township Public Schools. So that's $5.6 million. And the aid is gonna be reduced that adjustment is gonna be reduced to zero dollars from 5.6 million within a seven year period of time. So that's what it looks like with a half day kindergarten program. But when we have a full day kindergarten program, state aid is then adjusted. And I'll show you what that looks like. So if you recall, I'm gonna just shrink this just a little bit so you can see it. What I've highlighted in yellow is any place that I made a change. So here you can see in the half day kindergarten enrollment number, that's been zeroed out. And I added the about 400 kids into the elementary full day K and one through five line. And now our projected weighted enrollment went from 7,534 to 7,787 but it also affects the amount of children who are at risk only, LEP only, or LEP and low income combined. And those numbers were adjusted, those are in yellow. And then the projected weighted enrollment, which the entire formulaic aid package is, is uh, calculated against, goes from 7,884 to 8,153. So when we start going through the calculations that we did before, 
Each of these calculations highlighted in yellow is actually adjusted up, including special education, speech only, and the categorical aid of special education. So let's see what the equalization aid looks like. Remember, we calculated an adequacy budget, and the adequacy budget went from 104.3 million to 107.8 million. Local fair share remained the same. I didn't change that in the calculation. But the equalization aid went from 9.6 approximately million to 13 million. The effect of all of this was that our total categorical and formulaic aid went from 19.3 million to 23 million. So when we look at how do we calculate the adjustment aid, remember this is the aid that the state is gonna take away. Instead of $5.6 million of aid that would be removed, it's now 1.978 million. The difference here is 3.663, it's over almost $3.7 million difference. So our question and our challenge as a board is to try to develop a kindergarten program that's actually less than that. And if it's less than that, then that means that the program eventually will be paying for itself. Now, it's a couple of caveats. One is that the local fair share changes every single year, and the aid calculations change every single year. What this is is an academic exercise that would show if we did full day K this year, our adjustment aid or the aid that would be removed would be reduced by $3.6 million. So at this point, I'd like to open it up for questions from, from either the board or anyone else. Yes, Mr. Chillai. Uh, thank you, Dr. Chip. Thank you for the presentation sure. uh, and going through this state aid um, uh, sheet that they, what do they call it again? The state aid calculation, calculation yeah. worksheet, whatever. Uh, so let me ask you this question. Does the state differentiate um, kindergarten students from other students in calculating state aid? In other words, you added 200 students, um, but are they just 200 students? Yes, the, actually, I'll, and I'll show you on the actual state aid notice so you can see it here. Right here, right in this area, you can see that there's an area for half-day kindergarten. Right. And we have numbers in here because we have a half-day right. kindergarten. But here, it's elementary slash full day K and grades one through five. So they count full day kindergarten kids as they would any kid in grade first grade through, through fifth grade. And they count half day kindergarten as half of a student. And half that's, of a student. That's why it's important to, to note that when you're, when you're filling out your form to get the state aid. Exactly. In, in the, so, but, but here's the thing. So you're talking about adding 200 equivalent full-time students by I, I, approximately, right, with this data. But look, maybe building 200 houses in Hillsborough would add 200 full-time students, and we'd get the state aid or a reduction, or this calculation would be the same, because it'd be 200 students, but not only would you get that aid or have less aid taken away or however you want to say it, you'd also get like over a million dollars in property tax to the school district. So there's nothing special about adding full-time kindergarten students. In fact, it's, it would be more profitable to have 200 houses be built if you want to go down that game, right? We don't control that, though. <laughs> no, but people don't want 200 houses being built because they think it will, uh, it will hurt the school district and be tough to pay for. But it would be less difficult to pay for 200 houses being built than it would be to pay for full-time kindergarten. In, in terms of the property value, the, um, no, the in, property in, taxes? Well, that, that also, generate? that also, I didn't, even, I didn't even calculate that. I'm just talking about um, you, can, you can make your comparison between before we had full day kindergarten and, and before full day kindergarten after, you can make it with students we have now and 200 students moved in with, with new housing tomorrow. Yeah, that, that's correct. If we had 200 new students, okay. it would be an equivalent calculation. Right, but if the 200 students moved in with 200 new houses, you'd get your benefit of the state aid 
plus you'd get over a million dollars uh, in more property tax. Or, or everybody else is reduced by a million or however you want to say it. I mean, so if people don't want 200 houses being built here because they, they don't want to pay for that, they're certainly not going to want uh, 200 equivalent students uh, coming in without, in the same houses that already exist. I think that's going to be a tough sell. That's all. Okay. I just want to point out, that of course, Greg is right, that if we had 200 students coming from wherever, that we would get the same difference in state aid. But I do want to point out that it's not necessarily true about property taxes, because there have been developments where um, pilots or sure. have happened where we got zero property taxes That's to the true. school. And that has happened not only with new students coming into the school, living in properties, but businesses. That we are not in control of that. So as Judy rightly pointed out, we are not in control of that. We are in control of this. There are 200 probably kindergartners going elsewhere in our district uh, to all day kindergarten potentially who could benefit from this program and the school could probably have a zero sum game in terms of being able to provide that service as well as the educational benefits of having those kids in our schools identified earlier if they have any needs, and then um, uh, gain, gain those um, resources from the state. But I think this is something, again, the taxpayers have to decide of what, of what the value of a full day K is. What, what I think Dr. Schiff is po trying to point out is that this could pay for itself with respect to um, state aid. Uh, but it, it does require additional resources from the, on the part of the taxpayer initially to get this booted off the ground. Yeah. Brett? I just want to point out uh, to Mr. Gillette, if yeah. we put 200 new homes, yeah. we have 200 new kids we have to ha educate throughout the whole system. Okay. If we make it full day kindergarten, we have the same amount of kids, they just count differently. Okay. So we're not adding 200 kids to our school district. We're adding it on a f piece of paper to the town, to the government, so we we don't have the space crunch that we would have having 200 new families in every grade moving up from top to bottom. And also, as you point out, if we have 200 new families in this town, chances are they're not all starting at kindergarten. They'd be spread oh, out I, throughout I the district. Yeah, that mitigates your point, but I agree with that. Chris? As with most of the issues that come to this board, there are way too many variables in it, and it's very complex to look at the budget numbers and everything else. I, I think we have to look at this uh, as the, the complete package. To me, um, there's some potential financial value, I guess, in, it's hard to measure, not getting cut as much. It's not like we get more revenue, it's just we're not getting cut as much. Um, but I, I think you also have to look at what is the program we're, we're putting on the table and what does it mean for the district from, a, from an educational perspective. The standards that the state holds us to are based on a full, year, a full day kindergarten. And, it's, and regardless of what you feel about how our state evaluates us funding and evaluates how well we're doing, whatever, that, it sort of doesn't matter whether we agree with them or not, they make the rules. And if the rules they made are based on full day kindergarten, it seems to me we should give serious thought to doing that. Personally, I also believe that full day kindergarten would be a very valuable program for the, for the kids. And while every time I look at these numbers, my head spins, it does seem like there's a financial benefit to this. Uh, but I think you really have to look at it, and, and the, the township, and the, uh, the community has to look at this as a complete package, not just what is the financial impact, but what is the educational quality impact, and is this a program we want to have? And in the end, that's what people should consider all those facets when it comes down to uh, the referendum when we talk about this. But you really need to look at what we're doing for the kids along with what happens with the finances. Thank you. I appreciate that very much. Thank you for saying that, and thank you for all your comments. Jeep. So I wanted to address the point of <clears throat> the $3 million. Was it $3 million that we quoted for putting in full-day kindergarten and how that would offset or allow us to reduce? We would lose state aid more slowly. I just wanted to point out that that actually, it's true, except for the fact that we we would have to borrow, not borrow, we would have to raise a levy up front $3 million so that we would not lose $3 million on the tail end. So there are two different um, 
I guess, buckets of money is what I would say. So if we were to do that, our tax levy would be raised by $3 million in perpetuity. And I also wanted to point out that um, I believe kindergarten is not mandatory in the state of New Jersey. So although the um, state standards are based on full-day kindergarten, um, I guess it doesn't make sense to me that kindergarten is not mandatory that they would do such a thing. Um, also, so that was part one that I wanted to mention about the $3 million in the, um, to, to implement full-day kindergarten that would be potentially offset with loss in state aid. Then I wanted to kind of go into the state aid numbers and just really briefly, because um, I have the enrollment numbers I, the, uh, for the district over the last, whatever, 10 years, 15 years, comparing them to the state aid notice, I feel like there may be an error in the state aid notice because if you go back to 2006, which is the earliest that I have, the, the state aid numbers list an enrollment that's very close to the number on the spreadsheet. And I believe we had half-day kindergarten then. Is that true? Like, when, when did we implement half-day kindergarten? Has it always been in the district? Okay. So if you go back to the state aid notice from 2012 to 2013, they, they do prior year resident enrollment non-weighted. And so October 2006, they talk about a 7,562 enrollment number. And on our district enrollment summary, I was just looking at 2006 to 2007 school year. It's pretty close. It's like 14, like about 15 kids difference. Um, basically, they counted 15 kids less than we actually had. So pretty much it's consistent up until around 2015 when they undercounted us. So we had 7,300 kids, 7,319, and they counted us at 7,200. So we were down by 140. So I feel like, is it accurate to say that they would, like if, if their numbers don't match our enrollment numbers, is it accurate to say that if we went to full day kindergarten, they would actually count it correctly? Does that, is my question clear? Yeah, let me, let me just explain how that process works. There is a report that we send down to Trenton uh, around the late November, early December timeframe called the ASSA, and that is the application for school state aid. And that is the, num that is the accounting of all of the enrollment figures. So we go through a process to verify all of those numbers before they're sent up to, um, to the state of New Jersey, and, and they do it in a point in time, and that point is the October 15th enrollment. So the enrollment on that particular day during the school year controls what that aid is. Now, some of the things that you're referring to, uh, Mr. Trujillo, are actually the enrollment estimates that are estimated as part of the state aid notice. So the state aid does what's called a projected October 15th enrollment annually. So if you look on this page, right up on the big screen here, you can see that it gives, this is the projected 1819 state aid report. And what they do is they take the prior year residential and they do it for six years. And then they calculate a growth rate through all of this arithmetic that's, that's in this next section. And then they come up with the resident enrollment and the projected 10 2018 enrollment, but they don't know what that is because this is aid for the year that hasn't begun yet. So they have to estimate what that is. So the estimation is not necessarily the going to be what you see in terms of the October 15th enrollment on that day, on that sheet. Well, so I guess my question is do they go back when they look at October 2017 and go back to what it actually was on October 15th. There, there's 15. no adjustment. There's no, no adjustment. So they're wrong in, in certain, for example, like we just got the enrollment numbers for October of 2018 and it lists 2017 as 7361 and they're listing 7274. So well, they also don't count preschool. We don't get aid for oh, so any of the preschool okay, so that's, students. Okay. So we should, include our preschool students. Got it, okay. So that may actually be some of the numbers, but then it would actually drop, it would drop the numbers that, so basically they may be overcounting us. They may be giving us more 
they may be assuming more students because what I had seen is the numbers were pretty close comparable for the last few years. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm just, just questioning about how they got their numbers and whether we're confident that these numbers are accurate. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually more confident on the enrollment numbers than I am on the numbers on the local fair share. Okay. So when you look at the, the data that, that you have there under mm -hmm. local fair share from the 12-13 school year, mm -hmm. our local fair share increased by almost 30% in the community. And that was almost entirely driven by district income, not equalized property valuation. Now, I, when I go around the district and I tell people this, no one says I feel 30% wealthier over the past six, seven years. That's not the case. But what it's the case is that our, our income base in the community has grown. Um, and that is the difference between having adjustment aid and actually being underfunded in the year 12-13. So this district was underfunded by over $10 million six years ago. And yet now, we're overfunded by 5.6. That type of volatility is a problem within the state aid funding formula because that makes taxation and decisions about programs very, very difficult to predict from one year to the next. And the reason that this hasn't come out and, and our legislature hasn't had its hair on fire about this yet is because the funding formula has not been funded in the past eight years. In fact, it was only funded one year. Now they're gonna start funding the formula and what we're gonna to start to see is the volatility within the state aid funding formula. And that should be a concern for all people that care about um, good school policy because that's gonna be a real problem, both on the good side and the bad side too, that it can, that it can vary um, significantly and widely from one year to the next. Kind of makes planning a nightmare. Are there any more comments, questions? About this? Okay. All right, thank you, Madam President. I do have a couple of other uh, things to share, some great news from across the district. Um, first of all, congratulations to the pride of Hillsboro. The Marching Raiders uh, received second place with a score of 96.2875 on October 28th at the state championships. The band missed receiving first place by less than three hundredths of a point. In addition to receiving second place um, overall, the Raider Marching Band received the Caption Award for Best Music and the Esprit de Corps Award, which is presented to the band with the highest music score out of, the, out of every competing band. Following this fantastic state championship, the Raider Marching Band went on to compete in the regional championships two weekends ago in Maryland, where the band took first place overall with a score of 98.2125. Congratulations to Raider Marching Band and Band Directors Jewel Heron and Nick Clipperton on a job well done. Thank you also to the Hillsborough High School Raider Band Parent Association for all you do for our band. Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> Schools throughout our district have been celebrating our veterans in honor of Veterans Day over the last two weeks. Our elementary schools had annual, held annual Veterans Day assemblies and breakfasts, and some of our older students from the high school and middle school participated via band and choral performances. Each school invited the brave men and women who have served our armed forces and have special ties to each of our schools and teachers and students who attended them. On behalf of the Hillsborough Board of Education and the Hillsborough Township Public Schools, I want to take a very brief moment and offer our deepest appreciation for the sacrifice of our veterans, what they have made in order to protect our freedoms in our countries. We honor you and we thank you for their, your service. I am also pleased to announce that 10 of the 11 Hillsborough High School seniors who met with a representative from Ryder University on Instant Decision Day, that was Friday, November 2nd, were accepted to Ryder University. The 11th student is an applicant to a program that also requires audition and portfolio review, and that student should hear back soon. All 10 students that were accepted via Rutgers, um, via, excuse me, Ryder's instant decision also received merit scholarships ranging from $22,000 to $26,000 per year for a grand total of over $236,000. Congratulations to those students on their acceptance and their scholarships. 
And that's all I have this evening. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, I have a few comments that I would like to make. Um, today was a wonderful Veterans Day program at um, Triangle School, as it is every year. And I'd just like to say thanks to Ms. Golden, Ms. Casal, and all the teachers and kids who made it a very special day. And as the superintendent indicated, there were a lot of veterans there who attended, including one from World War II. Yep. And uh, all branches of the service were represented, and all of these people were our residents or related to somebody in the school. And um, honestly, for me, it's like a two tissue box event. Um, you know, it, it's just so wonderful to see everybody with sometimes their children, sometimes their grandchildren. Um, and it's just a wonderful event. So thank you to all the people at Triangle School who made that possible. Um, I also had a chance to jump into the Triangle School Library and have a slight chat with Taisha Gatto Barrera, our wonderful librarian over at Triangle. And I saw some brand new furniture that was delivered a couple of days ago. And when I inquired, it turns out that the Hillsborough, um, that the Triangle School HSA donated that furniture as a result of a several year fundraising drive. And it's beautiful. It provides some nice collaborative spaces for our, our students. And I'd just like to thank that HSA for this particular wonderful contribution. And of course, all the HSAs, because other HSAs are fundraising for other things, including air conditioning. And um, we just appreciate your partnership in improving our schools. So thank you, all of our HSAs. I'd also like to say thank you and congratulations to all candidates who ran for office in our recent election. Whether or not um, you won or lost, you set a very good example for citizenship by simply stepping up, so thank you. Um, our results are supposed to be certified tomorrow, uh, late tomorrow evening. Hopefully we'll have some, some closure on that. Um, statewide, voters approved $500 million for Votex, school security, and community colleges. Um, that item, which was on the ballot, received 52% favorable vote statewide. Additionally, there were 14 boards of ed across the state who, that asked voters to approve funding beyond the state's 2% tax levy cap. And most of them, surprisingly, were on, well, I guess not surprisingly, but most of them were for security additions to the schools, whether it was in the form of building improvements or SROs. Um, and the um, two districts um, approved uh, several hundred thousand dollars for full day kindergarten um, and mental health clinicians and seven districts approved security um, improvements and five um, five districts uh, rejected security improvements. Um, $240 million worth of construction proposals were also on the ballot for other towns, and two towns rejected um, their board's request, and four um, approved. Um, Moving, moving right along, I'd just also like to um, provide a report from the Governance Committee, which met, on, um, which met last week. Um, we reviewed draft language for referendum questions very tentatively. We reviewed full-day kindergarten costs and the state aid impact that you saw here tonight. And we reviewed some configuration possibilities which are still under discussion. Finally, um, last week I also attended with Joyce Eldridge Howard uh, the Partnership for, New Jersey, uh, for Drug Free New Jersey's event on November 1st at Hillsborough Middle School. This was an excellent program uh, sponsored um, by the Hillsborough uh, Millstone Municipal Alliance and with the assistance of our wonderful Minda Maggio and um, Anna Mailer and Joe Trabalski. So um, next year when that comes around, please attend. And um, this Wednesday, November 14th, there's a night of conversation about drugs sponsored by the prosecutor's office, the YMCA, and various prevention organizations. I went last, night, uh, last year, it was a very powerful event. 
7 o'clock on Wednesday at the Muni building, so please try to attend if you can. And that's it for me. Now I will take comments from the board, followed by comments from the public. Any further comments, board members? Or are we all talked out? <laughs> yes, Lorraine. Uh, I wasn't at last month, uh, last, the last meeting, but I did see congratulations to a, a couple of teams. Um, since then, our girls' gymnastics team has won the state championship. Our girls' volleyball team uh, won the first round of the state championship tournament but lost to Westfield in the second round, but congratulations still to them. And, um, and the uh, football team lost in the first round of the state, champ of the state championships. And I'm missing one other team, and I'm going to feel bad. It's soccer team. Oh, our, yeah, our soccer team Came lost. First. They, they won counties, which you announced last time, but in the state uh, tournament, they, they lost their first game of the season in the first round. But, but what a wonderful season for all of those, all of those teams. Our, teams. our teams always do well just by being there. And I'm sure our Team 75 is doing great, and our uh, Model UN and other uh, varsity academic teams are probably getting in the swing of things, so I look forward to hearing more about them as well. Yeah. I have a sports one. Yes. I have a sports one. Hillsboro senior Ryan Mitchell and the boys cross country team qualified uh, individually for the uh, group championships, which were held at Homedale Park on Saturday. I was in attendance. And uh, he did very well, finishing 17th in his, um, in his race, or six races that day and I think 45th overall out of, out of, out of, out of more than 800 uh, runners, I think, which qualified him uh, for the meet of champions uh, at Homedale Park, which will be on this Saturday coming up. We wish him uh, all the best, Ryan Mitchell. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, speaking of November 17th, we also have Borough Blast coming up on Saturday and a New Jersey School Board Delegates Assembly. <laughs> That's right, and, and actually everybody is welcome to attend the Delegate Assembly. There are no resolutions on the agenda um, on that day, but Senate President Steve Sweeney and the former Education Commissioner Lucille Davey will discuss pension and health care costs. Hmm. And yeah, <laughs> and actually, so also, while, we're, while I have the mic, um, Borough Blast is this Saturday from 10 to 4 at the high school gym. And it will feature a whole bunch of um, first Lego League teams. I believe they're grades four through eight. And Hillsborough Middle School's team will be competing that day. So come on out. It's free. It's open to the public. It's a nice event. Yeah, yeah. very Got nice. a couple times. Yeah. Any other comments? OK. Uh, I guess um, actually, I do have one question. Um, so just going back to this um, full day kindergarten and state aid our resolution in March, um, what is the time frame for um, putting that resolution, the wording, and getting that approved? Is it? Yeah, the board, the board is required to um, have 60-day notice to the election board before we put out a question to the public. Uh, but I anticipate that we, we're going to go through um, drafts this month uh, at each of the committees for the language. Uh, which we received uh, and which was reviewed by the governance committee and we made some adjustments to that. Uh, it's going through attorney review and we should have um, updates this week as education meets, I believe, Wednesday. tomorrow, tomorrow, right? Yeah. And then operations Wednesday. on Wednesday and, HR and then Wednesday. HR the following Monday. So, um, so I anticipate that the resolution wording will be voting on it sometime before the end of this year? Yes, exactly. Okay. So I, I'm... I'm as everybody knows, I'm very concerned about the, um, the question. I'm concerned about the tax impact, and I'm concerned about the fact that there's only a handful of people in the audience who kind of really even know that this is, is happening. Um, it, it doesn't really give, because basically today's November 12th, the next board meeting will be after Thanksgiving, November 20, I don't even remember, 26th. 26th. Um, it really doesn't give the public a lot of time to come and voice their opinions, one way or the other, as to whether what they would like to see prior to us, the nine of us voting as to whether, um, for the nine of us to vote as to what the wording will be, whether we even include full day kindergarten on this or, because we, because tonight's was only full day kindergarten, it was not um, about the 
making up surplus and going above the two percent cap for other um, issues for re reducing state aid. I'm, I'm concerned. It doesn't really give a lot of time for people to comment. I don't think people really even know it's on the horizon. Okay. Any other comments? Lorraine? I mean, just in answer to Jean, none of us on the board yet know what, what any of us is going to be. It's not a lack of transparency. It's that we're waiting for some some things, and we gave at governance some comments about the proposed wording. We have to see what comes back from our, our legal counsel, um, and then we'll discuss as a board. I mean, I think we're all concerned about uh, the wording, and we're all concerned about the tax implications, and until we actually have more information, there's not much more that we can say or share at this point. Um, just because some of us are you know, seem to be speaking in favor of full day kindergarten or, in fa you know, um, does not mean that we're 100% convinced until we actually know all the facts. So I think we, we all have to be patient and make sure that the, the, what's getting out to the public is informed and correct, not leaking things that come out of committee or, you know, things like that, because it's not going to be, it's not going to make them more informed. But I agree with you that we want to get everything out as soon as we possibly can to be able to get some response from the committee before we have to finalize the wording. So I would propose that when the wording is mostly finalized in committee, that we do similar to a first reading and a second reading, that we offer the resolution at a public meeting, perhaps November 26th, and allow a two-week comment period that people would actually be able to inform themselves. I mean, if they choose not to, that's, but at least they have the opportunity, rather than have us um, have the resolution in front of us with the projected tax impact and not have any, um, unless they happen to be in the audience that night, unless, um, to basically to give them a two-week window in which to make a comment. Well, it, you know, in addition to the comment of people who come to our podium here, we also have our website, which people have been commenting through either email or our special referendum information. Plus, we've been putting up all the presentations as we've been doing them. So the information is out there. People, yes, people have to look. And honestly, we don't have a very robust newspaper operation that's going to spread the information. Um, you know, and there are limits to what a board can do in terms of adv advocacy for a referendum. And I'm not even talking about advocacy, I'm talking about education. Yeah, it, so It am seems I. to me that um, the information is out there, but honestly, prior to being seated on this board, I really didn't pay much attention. I mean, and I think that's the average citizen in Hillsborough, and that's why they've elected us to do the research and do the homework. And I've done the homework and I'm really concerned, especially I don't want to vote, I don't want to vote, I don't want to get the number that night and vote that night. I really do think that we need time to hear what the, um, what the public has to say. Judy? Judy? Yeah. A, a, couple, a couple things. Um, I think, I understand what you're saying, Jean, but I think that the other thing we have to be careful of is uh, when it all comes down to it, that resolution is probably going to be with explanation. Three paragraphs? Is that a fair? It'll be an explanatory statement. That right. Will, that but will... but the, the reality is the thing that we, the thing that we vote on and the, and the language that we, obviously, we do care about the language from a legal perspective and we need to make sure it's correct and represents what we want to do. But it represents it in a couple paragraphs. The reality is if the public isn't going to learn much that night if they haven't been paying attention all along. That the approval of that language um, is about us putting together, effectively putting together a legal document which then leads to what is legally on the ballot for that referendum. But if, if the public isn't already paying attention or doesn't continue to pay attention throughout, um, I, I think the, that one number and the, and the wording of the referendum, um, if we had a full house that night, they're still not going to be educated. So while it's important that they see what's out there, I think it's more important that that as a district, we're getting that information out in much more detail. Um, you know, we had much more detail tonight about the school funding formula and what these numbers all mean. That explains a lot more than what understanding the referendum question will 
will help with, with the public. The other thing I want to add is going back to what uh, Lorraine said. I think it's, it's, we view this collectively as an important program to consider. Not to say that we all are in favor of it um, or that we will, would want to vote for it once we see all the numbers, but we do view it as an important enough program and an important enough financial situation that we should put a question out to the public. And I think that's what's critical is that we are putting it out there that we're giving the public the opportunity to weigh in. And, and it's a much longer process than trying to explain uh, you know, the referendum the night we put vote on it and present the number and, and the language. Right, so a couple of meetings ago, um, I voted in favor of the architect doing their work, their pre-work to kind of get us that estimate for full day kindergarten. Um, we've seen preliminary, right, so we did a resolution to hire them to do the paperwork to submit to the Department of Education. And at the time I said, you know, I was not convinced for the need of full day kindergarten. Um, but I was willing to do this because I wanted the public to have the ability to vote on it. But having seen preliminary numbers, I'm actually really concerned about giving the public the ability to vote on it. And the reason is, if, if full day kindergarten passes to the tune of $3 million, and the high school referendum in the fall fails, that, that $3 million levy, now where are we going to put those students? Where are we going? We, we have temporary trailers set up around all of the elementary schools, so that was part one. Part two is, I think we've kind of jumped the, like we've kind of taken full day kindergarten for granted that everybody wants it, and I would say that there's a population in our town that does not think that it's necessary. Furthermore, the strategic plan itself did not really convincingly say that full day kindergarten is an absolute, like the best thing since sliced bread. I mean, it really, like if you read the report, it talks about gains that are made with full day kindergarten kind of dropping off after third grade. And then, you know, you read a different variety of reports, you know, third grade, eighth grade, et cetera. So I feel like we've kind of jumped the, the you know, we've jumped a little bit ahead of ourselves to say, I mean, if full day kindergarten was like free, like free for the taxpayers, then yeah, sure. I mean, like, why not? But it's three million dollars. It is not free. It's three million dollars. Well, full day kindergarten, kindergarten. Okay. Full day kindergarten for this district will cost us three million dollars in the tax levy, and I am really concerned because that's not the only money that we're asking for in this in this resolu in this um, referendum question, right? We're asking for more money, and if. If the taxpayers say, you know, you're asking for money to go above 2% state aid, you're asking for money for surplus, and you're asking for this other thing, like, we're not made of, you know, unlimited dollars. So where, what is the priority? To me, the priority is the state aid and, and not losing staff, not, not adding additional staff for a program that we don't already have. Judy? Yes. Okay, so um, I agree with Jean that much like we vote on policy or we introduce uh, the annual budget, I don't think there would be anything wrong if it's possible, if the timeline works, to have a full proposal, including the wording and numbers, introduced at one meeting and vote on it at the following meeting. I don't think there would be anything wrong with that. I think that's what Gene was getting at. We do that for policy sometimes fairly inconsequential policies, you know, or sometimes, you know, whatever. And we always do that for the budget, it was always introduced, and then we vote on it. I don't know, look, if the timeline works, if somehow we had the, you know, because I, I, read, I read the um, proposed um, question, and it has the blanks at the top for, uh, for the amounts, and I like to see the blanks filled in, okay. and, and we're going to work on getting the wording just right during this week at, in committees. Of course, it has to go to the attorney. If somehow that can be done in two weeks, I know there's a holiday in between, but if somehow that, that would be great. And then, we're, and then we can vote, up, you know, see it that week, somebody report on it, um, or, you know, Dr. Schiff can report on it, uh, at, at, you know, if you will. And then we can vote on it at the following meeting. I, I don't think there'd be anything wrong with that. And I think um, for the discussion tonight, I think about um, the benefits or what have you of, full, of 
full day kindergarten or not. I think we've talked that out. I think we're on now to the question, the wording, the amounts. I think, I think that's it. We should probably go to the public. Okay, thank you. Uh, Chris? I, I, I would disagree with the idea that we've all assumed that this is what everybody wants. Um, I'll, I'll, look, I've been on the record since we started discussing this. I do believe it's a good program, but that's just me and that's my opinion. And I don't assume that anybody or any percentage of the public or this board agrees with me or doesn't agree with me. Um, and I don't think we've jumped over that step. As I said before, what we've gotten to is a point where we think this is a program that has potentially enough merit for its value that we should put the question out there. Not because we all think that everybody's going to go for it and it's just a matter of packaging it up and putting a number on it so they can approve it. We're just saying that we believe it's important enough and it has enough potential value that the public should make a decision. That it isn't something that's a small number and a policy change that the board would just take action on, but that it is something that while we have no idea where the public is going to go, we certainly believe it has merit to present to the public. So I don't think we've jumped to the assumption that everybody wants it. Just that we're saying it seems to be a question that we really need to get the public's answer on and not make an assumption. And I agree with that. I think that's why I'm so concerned that it's, we're asking it as a combined question because basically if we go March 12th, March 13th for the referendum as a combined question and that question fails, what does that mean for our 2019-20 budget? That's my biggest concern. It, it means the same thing as if we made three questions and they all failed. At the end of the day, the, we are elected to make most of the decisions and put together a comprehensive plan for the public to evaluate. Um, the public doesn't want us to break it down and make them analyze three, four, five different questions because they don't have the information that we have in the first place. We need to put together a comprehensive plan that we think is fair and reasonable, explain it to the public, and let them either agree or disagree with the job we're doing. If we can't challenge them to evaluate multiple questions where they don't have the background of information and experience to really make those judgments. So then here's my concern, is that when people, if, if people don't do the research, as I did when I first moved here in 2002, and the question was to raise my taxes, and I didn't know what it was, I would vote no. So then you would have basically half the town who would not benefit from full-day kindergarten voting no, and all of the people who have children, K and younger, voting yes. I mean, that's not, to me, that's not the best way to make um, policy and direction for the town. I mean, it's basically, right, because everybody's going to do it in their self-interest. So I, that's my biggest concern, is, is we should say, you know, I think full-day kindergarten is a worthwhile program. We have space for it in the high school, in this new high school, which I still am not convinced of. But, you know, I think that asking the question for full-day kindergarten in the, in the question with the high school in November or in the fall of 2019 is, is, a, um, is a better, would be better for the community. And to stick in March, to stay in March merely for the... Um, going above the 2% cap. Now, I still think that the 2% cap might go down, too, because if you don't know what the, um, what the question really is and you just don't want your taxes raised, you're going to vote no, right? However, it would be a smaller number that we're asking for the community, and that's kind of where I'm thinking right now. I, I, uh, yeah, I'd just like to respond a little bit. I, I think, first of all, we, we shouldn't put... We should put a number out there we believe. We shouldn't put out a small number so we can get it passed but not do the things we believe we need to do. If there are things we believe we need to do, we should put a fair number on it and let the public decide. But we shouldn't say, we shouldn't decide for the public what should or shouldn't be in it. It's our job to research and figure out the programs we believe in and put that out there. And we shouldn't contrive a number because we've evaluated what are the odds of passing. What we should be doing is putting together a plan we believe in. The other thing is I think the public doesn't vote in their self-interest. Some do. Many don't. Um, I'm here. I'm on the Board of Education. My kids are long out of this district. I have no, my self-interest would be to vote no on everything that costs a dime, and I don't do that. You've already heard me say that I'm in favor of this program. And there are people, I believe, no, I guess maybe he left. No, he's still here. There are people here in this audience tonight who've been very supportive of this board whose kids also are long gone. There are people who believe in what we are doing for the quality of the education in this town, and there are people who will support it if we put together a comprehensive plan that shows that we've thought through the issues and we've put together 
a plan that shows thought and a, a likelihood of having a meaningful impact on the education in this town. I would just like to put out there from the perspective of an educator that I've lived in this town for over 30 years. I've seen the diversity in this town change. I've seen a lot of uh, socioeconomic changes, although we'd like to think that we're very prosperous here. The affordable housing that has been built in town has created another socioeconomic impact on our community. I think that um, full day kindergarten, we are one of three districts in Somerset County. If I'm wrong, please correct me. But uh, we are one of three that I understand are without a full day kindergarten. At this point in time in our society, I believe that it's important to have children have a good foundation from the beginning when we are getting children from all different areas of different communities for uh, their kindergarten experience and then coming to us, we are at a disadvantage because we have not been able to educate them all as a community together. That is um, something that I know as a primary teacher and looking at children who were coming through the system, it got diversified more and more as the years went on. So I think there's something to be said and looked and researched to that effect also, because I think we're doing a disadvantage to our children if we're not giving them the opportunity to join in our community at an early age and establish a foundation of um, the technology and the other advantages that we can offer at an early stage in their education. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Are, are there any more board comments on this? I, I would just like to add to what Ann and Chris just said. Um, I, I appreciate your comments and you're clearly entitled to your opinion, but I disagree that this is a leap for Hillsborough. Um, as Ann said, we're one of three in Somerset County, but we're also um, one of 15% of districts in the state because 85% of districts have full-time K. Um, and also the state standards for kindergarten also reflect a full-time kindergarten, not a two and a half hour kindergarten day. Um, <clears throat> I think we have always been a very efficient district, um, actually exceptionally so. And I sort of have this theory that, you know, you either spend now or you spend later. And I think kindergarten, a full day kindergarten would provide us the opportunity to diagnose problems, get them early, get people, get children um, more able to read at an appropriate age so that they don't fall behind not only in reading, but in every other subject that requires reading, um, such as science and um, social studies and other subjects and you know I, I really must look at this for educational value and I have to say to all people who are looking for a number and I appreciate that we started with some very high numbers which would have scared the daylights out of people and we have whittled them down significantly and just like that before we go out to the public with a number that may prove inaccurate I think it's really important to just make sure that everything's very tight and very defensible um, if we're going to put it out for a public question. Um, I have no problem with two meetings about it if uh, time allows. We do have that 60-day requirement. Um, however, um, we could also put the information out two weeks in advance, even if there's no board meeting, and invite people to come. But the one thing I also need to invite, you know, to mention when you talk about people who don't pay attention, we supposedly had a huge election last week. Well, guess what? 42% of the people in Hillsborough voted. Okay? Record for a congressional year. Okay? 
Presidential year, 73%. Gubernatorial year, 42%. Okay, this year, for all intents and purposes, should have been around 25 to 30, but it wasn't. But I don't pat anybody on the back when you have 42% turnout. So no matter what we do, and no matter how many people we inform, a whole bunch of people, in fact, this year, the majority stayed home. Doesn't take away our obligation to educate and inform, but I'm not sure any of that's gonna have the effect that you would like it to have. And I'm very, I'll be the first one to say, I'm devastatingly sorry, because I would love to see everybody vote every time. So, so I have um, just one more comment, if I may, and mm -hmm. then I'll be quiet on this issue. Sure. Um, of the other districts in Somerset County that have full day kindergarten, did they implement full day kindergarten prior to the two percent cap? Because some Montgomery, didn't, some didn't. because so they might have had space. Is that right? Because Montgomery and Bridgewater, when I talk to their board members, they say it's not even on the table. They just there's no money. That 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 is not a priority in their districts. And on that same note, what I find kind of funny sometimes is like when, when Hillsborough kind of goes it alone and we like what we're doing, we say, well, it doesn't really matter what everybody else is doing. But when we want to do something like full day kindergarten, we say, well, we're only three out of, you know, however many in the 21 districts in Somerset County. So it's, it's, it's frustrating. Well, I understand that, but this is also the product of what, four years now of strategic planning. And I have to remind people, this started with the community. It started with multiple meetings in strategic planning where the community came to this very room and offered their input. What are your three big priorities? And we got 50 big priorities. <coughs> and, you know, it whittled down to this. And now we're doing serious, you know, re we did serious research for over a year. And here we are now, and, and these were the things that the community asked, and we're still going to ask the community. The bottom line is, all we could do is put it on the ballot. The community will still have the opportunity to thumbs up or thumbs down. One other thing from uh, the school board association uh, information that I gave before about what happened in other districts, there were several districts that had two questions and both were rejected. There were no districts where one that had two questions where one was approved and the other was rejected. So, you know, there's no magic to how, you know, how to put something on a ballot. I'm not really, I mean, is that fair? <laughs> you know, it's up to the public. It's yes. always been Speaking up to the public. public. Yeah. What's that? Speaking of public. Yes, okay. Uh, are we ready for public comment? Okay, public comment, patiently waiting. Good evening, my name is Bob Lisi, 37 Uncle Drive. Uh, I, I've put three children through school here in Hillsboro, mm -hmm. from kindergarten all the way through high school, and all three children of mine have graduated college. Uh, what, I, what I'm hearing here is nothing but talk about money here, dollars and cents, and not looking at what the educational process of having a full day kindergarten. What's the average of a half a day kindergarten of what does a child absorb in that half a day? One hour, an hour and a half? What educational benefit is? Ask the parents uh, that put their children through full day daycare, okay, and see what the results are from that. And these are kids that are younger than kids who go to kindergarten. So I'm looking here and just my suggestion is that Look at the educational needs. You, these kids, their, their minds are like sponges. They're going to absorb it. And that, to me, is the most important thing. So I would, the other thing, I've heard uh, questions here, well, how does the, does the public know? The word is out there. The public, through the grapevine, has some inclination that there is talk about full day kindergarten. But the board has not advertised it fully, that there's, con there's conversation about that. There's just a little bit of talk among parents. So what I do, what I'm asking you is to present 
to the public. Have them come out and have them give me your input. Do a board meeting just strictly, or one meeting, strictly just, you know, all day kindergarten. Just, just bring the public out that. If you, I think if you strike that nerve about full day kindergarten, I think you're going to get a response. But yes, I agree that you people, nine people, are, uh, it's your responsibility to come up with the questions and, and do that and figure out the money and all that. But look at the public. Look for input from them. Seek them out. They want to be seeked out. Like I said, I mean, there's chat, chatter. They're all talking, but they don't hear anything from the, from, from the board saying, hey, we need you. So thank you for hearing me out. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good evening. Uh, Tom Zubelli, 9 Upper Neshanic Court. Um, I guess I wanted some points of clarification uh, as it refers to that referendum. Uh, I guess uh, I first want to thank Ms. Trujillo for her comments. I more or less agree with what she had to say this evening. Uh, but two questions I had. The, is the $3 million in reference to the 2% cap, or is that separate? Is, that, is the $3 million in reference to paying for the full-day kindergarten? OK, Mr. Gillette is shaking his head yes. Oh, sorry. So for that, the, witness, right? fine. I guess, <laughs> so if that's the case, is $3 million, is it a one-time $3 million, or is it in perpetuity, which I did hear from Mr. Hirlo. It, what is, is it one time three million or are we talking several years of three million dollars? You wanna hit that? Sure. <clears throat> the question that the board's considering to put out is a question of a reoccurring expense. So teaching staff members reoccur one year after the other. It's not a one time shot. It's to fund a reoccurring expense of full-day kindergarten. Okay, and then and then um, I know it was mentioned that there might be details about how much the two percent cap would be raised. Um, again, I come to these meetings and I become more and more surprised and shocked. Quite honestly, as I said the last meeting, I was astounded uh, because. From my understanding, I thought the reasoning behind raising the 2% cap was to help pay for the full day kindergarten. But now I'm hearing we're paying reoccurring $3 million a year for God knows how long, plus a 2% cap, plus a brand new high school. I, 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 I mean, again, people are paying twelve, you know, eight dollars to $20,000 in property taxes. I have people in my own neighborhood who are selling their homes because they're putting their kids through college. They can't afford the taxes anymore, and they're trying to... I, I, I don't understand. I, I'm like, my head is about to explode because I feel like what I understood it to be was we're raising the 2% cap because we want to pay for the full day kindergarten. So why are we raising the 2% cap if we're also asking for $3 million for several years down the road to pay for the full day? What is the reasoning behind the 2% cap and the three? Like, I don't understand what's the, so why are we raising the 2% cap? Or asking the voters to raise it, why? The 2% cap is on our current tax levy budget. The amount of money that will go to full-day kindergarten is an additional item <coughs> in our budget. And, you know, things could adjust based on what the state aid formula is, as okay. Dr. Schiff explained. And that's unfortunately, as he said, volatile. Some years it could be something, some years it could be plus, some years it could be minus. So may I ask And that gets adjusted on an annual basis. Fair this enough. is November. Our budget process starts at this time of the year, actually a month ago, and that will be decided in March. May I ask what the two percent if we if if it's approved by the voters, what will the two what will the raise, the increase in the two percent cap be used for? I'm sorry. I feel like we, you know, it was put forth to us, we want full day kindergarten and we want to raise the 2% cap. But now that I have a better understanding, I want to know why or what that money is going to be used for, for the 2% so, cap increase. Tom, so I'm going to answer, because I, I reported this maybe a couple of times during operations committee, but sometimes I speak fast. Um, so, so we're looking at a question for okay. March. Yes. Okay. And uh, there's kind of, it's kind of like two issues, but they all, um, they, they're, they're, they're combined in, into one 
question because they all have to do with raising the tax levy above the 2% cap. You've already heard tonight that it will take approximately $3 million, and we don't have the exact number yet, but that will be announced when Fair we enough. have the exact question. Approximately $3 million ongoing to implement full day kindergarten in this district. But you also heard me report over the past several months that um, our expenses have far exceeded uh, our budget appropriations during the last year. We went uh, over a million and a half dollars into our uh, surplus, not our, um, our, fund our our fund balance surplus. But but so in other words, not our extra surplus, but our required surplus required by the state. That has to be made up. So uh, you can expect. Uh, well, what I reported was that we're looking to increase the tax levy to make up for the amount that we had to go in, and that's ongoing. Okay. That's not, that wasn't a one-time thing. This is ongoing because of increased transportation costs, increased special education costs, uh, other things that are pretty much out of our control. And so that's part of it. The other thing is the potential loss of state aid, uh, equalization aid, which Dr. Schiff has reported on several times. And this isn't something that, we, that we're just only speculating on. The state has indicated how much uh, they're going to reduce the equalization aid each year for schools that they find have been overfunded, that they think were overfunded, so they're going to reduce their equalization aid by a certain percentage, I think 15% maybe for next year or something like that, or close to it. Close to it. So we don't know the exact number, but as hopefully in two weeks from tonight, maybe we will. So those are the two components. Okay. Um, so there's actually three components. Three million dollars we've already heard about for um, kindergarten. Uh, um, an amount to make up for how much we have to, had to go into our surplus that will be ongoing. Not for one-time things, but just ongoing. And also potential uh, future loss of state aid. We'll put all those three numbers together. They all are the same thing. They're increasing the tax levy above the 2%. That will be the question. Okay. okay. So when, we'll, when, we, when we know the numbers, we'll tell you. If we start throwing around numbers that we don't know, that might get reported, that might get put all over the Facebooks, and if things like that, and, and we won't be able to take it back. We'll know soon enough. Understood. Right. Thank, thank you for the letting, clarification, uh, and uh, thank, thank you, Superintendent Schiff, for the presentation this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Jane Stats, 101 Devonshire Court. Um, thank you for all the information. Um, some of it's over overwhelming. But as far as the cost for a full day kindergarten, um, about it being recouped, I'm um, paraphrasing. Um, I guess in the overall cost, I guess we'll see a lot of that back. But to be honest with you, the taxpayer won't see that. And I think that's the impact a lot of people are concerned about. On the other hand, um, sort of related to what Ms. Harris said, um, you know, for uh, the, the state is saying we should have full day kindergarten and that's what the standards are based on. So we have children who um, go to the half day kindergarten here and then they go to a, a wonderful daycare that provides and balances out, maybe provide, uh, you know, to provide a, the equivalent of a full day kindergarten with their educational programs. But those are some of our students and some of our students might have parents that can't afford that. So they have, um, uh, you know, maybe a relative or a friend who, who babysits them that can't, does not have the expertise uh, or the background to, to really provide that education to balance out and provide the equivalent combined with a half-day kindergarten here in Hillsborough, the Hillsborough schools to provide a full-day kindergarten. So um, out of concern for that uh, um, and the fact that the state is, re you know, has these standards based on full-day kindergarten. Um, it would only be fair. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. Good evening. Good evening. Mm -hmm. My name is Joyce Eldridge Howard. I live at 75 Weber Avenue. I, I was a former kindergarten teacher for mm, about eight years. And I had seen throughout the years the differences. Students come in to enter the schools. Some have a lot of skills. That some of them have their parents uh, have taken them to all kinds of cultural experiences. They've had that. There are some students who come in without anything. 
And then there are some students who come in with special needs. So when those students enter the kindergarten, they have that whole year. If they have to come in at the first grade with a half day kindergarten, that sets them back. I'm going to read you uh, uh, some, there's a lot of studies out about this. And I'm going to talk about here, read it to you, it's about, is cost effective? Investments in quality early childhood programs generate returns of three to one or even higher, which translates to three dollars saved for every dollar invested. An early investment in child and children, uh, and their emotional and intellectual skills, means grade retention and dropout for students uh, later in life. So students who come to school, if that early, that foundation, you, it's so important. I can't even tell you how much it is. I, I know. I've been there. I just, I'm pro uh, full day kindergarten because that half day is a great loss for the students. Thank you very much. Is there any more public comment? Okay, we'll move to the action agenda. Thank you, Madam President. I ask for the board's consideration of the following motions that I'm making under the area of education to approve travel and related expenses to affirm uh, the superintendent's uh, HIB determination list that's attached to approve overnight field trip is listed and to approve the two field trip destinations. Okay, may I have a motion for items 10-1 um, through 10-4? So moved. Thank you. Second. Second. Thank you. Are there any questions or comments about any of the items in the um, action agenda? In the education agenda, sorry. Okay. Um, roll call. Sure, Mr. Cooper? Uh, yes. Mr. Gillette? Yes. Ms. Harris? Yes. Mr. Pulsifer? Yes. Dr. Yes. Sasson? Yes. Mr. Heo? Yes. And Ms. Haas? Yes. Motion passes. Good. Thank you, Madam President. I ask for the board's consideration of the following motions under the area of human resources that I'm recommending. First, to approve the resolution to create a um, new position, a personal nurse aide position. Also to approve the retirements as resig and resignations as listed, including the retirement of Lok Nayin, who's a Triangle um, School custodian who has been with us since 2003, as well as Donna Ritter, special education teacher at Hillsborough Middle School, who has been with us since September 1, 1999. And we thank them for their service to our students and our school district. Also to approve the revised leaves of absence is listed, the revised co-curricular advisors, revised sixth grade period coverage, and approve the contract changes as listed. Also approve the um, appointments of an acting principal, long-term substitute instructional assistants, lunch aides, health benefit payroll assistant, co-curricular advisors, and substitutes as attached. Also to approve additional substitute teachers and approve the respite day for staff of staff, actually, it's for families, and to pre-approve extra period coverage, and to approve extra period coverage as attached. Okay. May I have a motion and second for items 11.1 through 11.11? .11? So moved. Thank you. Second? Second. Thank you. Are there any questions or comments about items in the HR agenda? Lorraine? So I sent an email this afternoon regarding item 1109 and 1110 that there was a duplication um, of a staff member from respite day uh, that was cited in both sections. And I have um, received verification, I'm just alerting the rest of the board, um, that the duplication in 1110 was in fact a duplication. So that first row from 1110 um, will be removed, and we're, we're just approving it as 11-9. As, as recommended. We'll make the changes okay. in the minutes. Um, I have a question, not specifically on this, but it kind of just reminds me. Um, so what is the process, so, so specifically about the um, additional instructional aids, or just even 
additional positions that get added during the school year. Because um, I know in the past several board meetings, we and even last year, 2017 to 18, we've added quite a few instructional aid positions during the school year. What happens if, like, we run out of money? Like, like do we ever just we run out of money and, like, we can't? That's one of the reasons why we operate with surplus. The concern is, is that our surplus is much lower than it's ever been in the past. So what if we hit our surplus? I mean, so that you've said that doesn't happen, has not happened, but let's say, you know, the hypothetical 200 families move in and et cetera. Like, what happens then? Like, I so, mean, do we just not hire instructional aides? No, so you're actually making the argument for the replenishment of the appropriate surplus, and that can be done by a few different means. One is to ask the community to raise the levy in order to close that gap, or to cut a couple million dollars worth of staff and programs. But during the or a combination year? of the two. But like during, let's say you know it's October and we have no surplus, do we not create an instructional aid position? That seems like we would be in violation of some other law. Like what do we do? Yeah, we wouldn't begin the school year with not enough surplus left. And by the way, the eight hundred thousand is what's going to be in the fund balance going moving forward into the fiscal year 20 budget. But that being said, we would not begin the year. We would have to make the reductions in order to have a healthy oh, surplus before we even began the year. So our, our fund balance surplus for the start of the 2018-19 year was full. We're just anticipating, is that right? So we had 2.6? Well, no, no, it's accurate that we ended last year with $800,000 um, left in the bank, basically. So what that happens, it's an accounting process to take that particular dollar figure, which comes in through the, through the audit, and the board um, received a preliminary report through the audit, but the audit is certified this time of the school year, but then it is put into the revenue in next year's budget as a revenue. That's why we're short moving into next budget year by, it's actually approximately closer to two million than, than 1.6 that was spoken about before. Oh, so so typically worse. about <laughs> about two point eight million, and we have eight hundred thousand that that's um, that's left in the kit. Got it. Okay. Any other comments or questions? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Roll call. Sure, Mr. Cooper. Yes. Mr. Gillette. Yes. Ms. Harris. Yes. Mr. Pulsifer. Yes. Dr. Sasson. Yes. Ms. Trujillo. Yes. Ms. Haas. Yes. Motion passes. Thank you. I ask for the board's consideration of the following motions under the area of operations to accept the donations from First Teresa Moda for 18 black frames for the district art program. And we thank her for her generous donation, as well as 526 dictionaries for third grade classes, third grade students from around the district that is uh, donated annually by the Hillsborough Rotary Club. And we thank them for their generosity as well. Also to approve the addendum to the settlement agreement for an out-of-district placement. Okay. Um, we oh, I'm sorry. I, I, yeah, missed, I missed one. My, my apologies. Also to appoint Mr. Mahmood as the public agency compliance officer for the current school year. Okay. May I have a motion? For so moved. Let me finish. 12, oh, sorry. 12 one through 12-4. I always forget you have to you, you you have say to the numbers. Yeah. You're numbers. I never did. Uh, so moved. Second. Second. Thank you. Any questions or comments on any of the operations items? We're good? Yay. Mm. Roll call. Mr. Cooper? Yes. Mr. Gillette? Yes. Ms. Harris? Yes. Mr. Pulsifer? Yes. Dr. Sasson? Yes. Ms. Trujillo? Yes. Ms. Haas? Yes. Motion passes. Okay. Um, under informational, we have a number of uh, data points that have been provided. And uh, we're back to comments uh, from the board and public on old business. I would just also like to mention if anybody has comments on the 2019-20 um, budget process. I sort of missed that, but sort of included it at the same time. So if there are any more of those, please come up. Hello. Hello. Elena Masseri, Hillsborough Education Association, Hillsborough High School. I have not reported out on the wonderful things that the... We've missed you. I, sorry. I've missed you all as well. So um, tonight I'd like to just highlight a couple of things that have been going on throughout the district since the beginning of the school year. 
Um, going on in Hillsborough Middle School is uh, Project Linus for about three to four years. Current and former HEA members meet on a monthly basis to crochet baby blankets and baby hats together, which are eventually donated to local hospitals and shelters. During the past year, member Agnes Sagliocco has personally crocheted and do donated to this cause over a dozen blankets and close to 200 baby hats. Uh, she has pictures available if you would like to see of the items she has made and donated. Thank you. Awesome. Okay. Uh, Woods Road staff and students went pink to, uh, to fight breast cancer in early October. Staff contributed money by paying to wear jeans for the week. $350 was donated to Susan G. Komen for the cure. Maria Schaub organizes this event every year and has an annual photo if you would like to see it. That same day, Aileen Barrios organizes a pink hair extension event for the whole school. Her sister Susie, co-owner of Hair Plus and her staff, come in during the lunch periods. For a $12 fee, all money is donated, students and staff get a pink hair extension. Over 150 hair extensions went out this year. This is another annual event when Woods Road goes pink. Also from Woods Road Elementary, Erica Katz has organized a group of teachers to participate in the Walk for Autism. She sold shirts to support this great cause and staff wore their shirts to show their support for the walkers on Saturday, October 13th. Woods Road School embraces all of their students. Deb Mamawala and several staff members, both current and retired from Triangle, visited senior citizens at Foothill Acres for their Halloween celebration and entertained with music, games, and prizes. And most recently, 20 plus members of the Hillsborough Education Association teamed up with the Ark of Somerset County to beautify their group home um, over at, on Artsley, over by Woods Road. We cut down, quote, shrubs, which were really trees, <laughs> did, some, did some landscaping, planting, provided snacks, and not only for our members, but for the residents of the house. Thank you, and I'll see you next month. Thank you. Thank you very much. So this is the news I love to hear. <laughs> so thank you for that. Um, okay, are there any further comments or yes. questions? Yes. Uh, my apologies, I meant to bring this up uh, during the education portion of the agenda. Uh, we approved tonight the overnight trip for the, the Hershey trip for the eighth graders. And I just wanna, uh, we, we cannot say enough times thank you to the teachers who make this program work. Um, it's an amazing undertaking. The kids have a great time, but I know there's a, a huge amount of work that goes into making that uh, program the success it is, and it all falls back on the teachers uh, and the parent volunteers who, who get together to make it happen. So uh, thank you very much for all that, and we can't say thanks enough, but uh, I'd love to see that program keep going, and it's, the kids love it, and, uh, and our teachers do a great job putting it together, so thank you. Yeah, it's one of those traditions in our district, sort of like the tile top tables that, you know, people always made in Woodshop yeah. that you see in every house in Hillsborough. Yes. But yes, the Hershey trip is very important, and thank you for everybody who's involved in that. Yeah. It's, a nice, it's a nice ending to the middle school section of our Hershey students' lives. Year. It's it's a, next May, right? Yeah. It's a new teacher running it this year. Yeah. New teacher running it since Mr. Gill retired. Yeah. There's a new teacher. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Last call for comments because I'm going to wave this thing. Yes, going once, going twice. I'll take a motion to adjourn. So moved. So moved. Thank you. Second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? We're adjourned. See you on November 26th. Have a happy Thanksgiving, everybody. Who's in charge of that? 